Well, welcome friends to this uh, first in the series on uh, creating beloved community and this uh, webinar focused on resources for leading mental health informed worship. My name is uh, Adam Hanley and I serve at the General Council office as the program coordinator for ministry personnel vitality and have spent a few years offering resource to the mental health working group and uh, continue with the standards for accreditation committee as we work towards developing uh, learning outcomes for mental health training uh, with me today is uh reverend dr sarah lund from uh, the united church of christ our full communion uh, partner, and I'll uh, ask Sarah to introduce herself. Hello, everyone. It is good to be together in beloved community in this learning space. I want to bring you greetings from your uh, siblings in Christ, United Church of Christ here in the United States, on behalf of our general minister and president, John Dorhauer, and our elected officers, Reverend Tracy Blackman and Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson. It is good to be together in community. I'm also a local church pastor in the United Church of Christ, and I'm coming to you from my home in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I serve as senior pastor of First Congregational United Church of Christ. My role in the wider church is to be an educator and an advocate, and I serve in a part-time role as the denomination's minister for disabilities and mental health justice. And so in our learning series, we are going to share resources and share ideas and provide mutual support and encouragement as we are all in this together, working for God's hope and healing for all people. And so it is a joy to be with you here today. Thank you. And as we uh, launch into this time of learning, I just wanted to mention uh, in your link, uh, that you were an email you were sent. Uh, you obviously found the link to this Zoom gathering, but if you're finding your audio is breaking out and you're having a bit of trouble participating, also in that email is the 1-800 number that you can call in to connect uh, by telephone to uh, hear what is happening. Also, we're gonna be uh, engaging in the chat as our primary way of participating in the webinar. And if uh, you find the font is a bit small and uh, it's you're having trouble participating because of that. Uh, if you do a control and the plus sign in the chat, it will make the font bigger and easier to see. Also, I wanted to mention that as we engage in this, uh, in other experiences I've had facilitating these kinds of conversations, I recognize that folks bring their own uh, history and struggles with their mental health to this conversation. And sometimes these conversations can bring up uh, bits of our stories. And so I wanted to mention two different things. If uh, during this session, uh, you feel like you're in crisis and you need some immediate assistance, uh, I'd invite you to contact our employee and family assistance providers. They're 24-hour uh, counselors that are uh, present to offer immediate help and a few sessions of ongoing help. And so I've just put those numbers, I'm just putting those numbers in the chat. As well, uh, Sarah and I are both uh, open to stay on the, the call after. So after uh, we conclude with a closing blessing, if you wish uh, to engage either of us in further uh, pastoral support, we're uh, willing to stay on and can sneak into a private uh, breakout room for that support. Uh, as well, but this series I think is timed as we look ahead to our second mental health Sunday on the first Sunday of May. And if you navigate to the United Church website in the worship resources section, uh, both of our denominations have worked together to collect worship resources. And so they are found on our worship resources section of our website under mental health Sunday. <laughs> 
Friends, I, as we gather, I invite you to find your feet on the floor of wherever you are joining us today and know whether you're many floors up in a high rise or in a home quite near to the ground that the creation of our God is beneath our feet. I acknowledge today that I'm connecting from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. Toronto is now home to many ind Indigenous, First Nation, Innu, and Métis people. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. In the midst of multi-generational trauma, Indigenous communities continue their stewardship of the land. And as we gather today, let us be mindful of their realities, informing our words and actions with the spirit of truth and reconciliation. And as we often do when we gather, I invite you to offer an acknowledgement of the land that you're joining from in our chat. While you are thinking about that, um, I want to encourage you to be interactive as you're comfortable sharing in the chat. And if you don't uh, mind uh, showing your video just for a moment, I'd love to just see your faces as a way to connect uh, personally. You don't have to keep your video on all the time, but it helps me to, to know who's here and to get a sense of our community. So thank you for, if you're comfortable doing that, just to say hello and uh, welcome. You can keep your video on or off as you're comfortable, but I'm just so happy to be here with you all. Thank you so much. I first met Sarah at an educational workshop I attended in early 2018 and have been grateful for the connection with Sarah and the ways that uh, her leadership and resources informed the mental health working group that uh, was working earlier in this uh, quadrennium. As part of that relationship, she was able to share some worship resources that she's provided to the United Church of Christ, and I want to share one of her prayers now. So I invite you to take a deep breath in, and ground ourselves, and let us join in prayer together. God of love, today as we gather, stir in us deep compassion for people living with brain disorders and their families. Raise our awareness of how we can create a supportive and safe spiritual community for people who feel isolated, shunned, and ashamed. Inspire us to reach out in love as a sign of your radical hospitality and grace. Encourage us to receive the gifts that are given by all, including those who are living with mental health challenges. In your love, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. This is sacred space. And as I come here in community with you all, I want to share just as we start that I am a person with lived experiences of mental health challenges. And so you'll notice my language with that. Um, I identify as a person who is in recovery from complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And so I am an active, therapy, and continually working on my mental health, body, mind, and spirit. I am in a family of, of people with mental health challenges, and I've written about it publicly, and I have the permission to share. I'm in a marriage where my husband has um, depressive disorder and anxiety disorder, and so it's a dynamic we navigate every day in our marriage. And then I come from generations of people with serious mental illness. And what I feel called to do in beloved community is to break the silence about mental health challenges and addictions and brain disorders. And so I invite you as you're comfortable to begin dreaming with me how God is calling you to be part of this global movement to break the silence about mental health challenges. It is a joy to be part of beloved community 
we are starting to realize that brain health and mental health is closely affiliated with spirituality. And so I want to begin this conversation as we think about how to have mental health inform our worship, to acknowledge the power of spirituality to support positive mental health, to support recovery and wellness. It's a beautiful moment in time where our science is catching up to what people of faith have always known, that there is a power, a spiritual power, a healing power that we have in our faith tradition. I want to begin by thinking with you about beloved community and what that means. It means that we are a people of God called to both love and justice. And in the tradition of the civil rights movement and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who spoke so eloquently about beloved community, this idea that love without action is, is nothing, but love with justice is how we transform society. The arc of the universe is long and it bends towards justice. We are all interwoven into this tapestry, you and me and everyone. And part of that are people with disabilities, people with invisible disabilities and visible disabilities. And so beloved community includes all of us working together in love for justice. We know that people with disabilities and mental health challenges are on the margins, even though it's one of the largest minority groups in the world. If you think about the global population and how many people live with a disability, it's considered the largest marginalized group in the world. Yet because of the stigma, we have so many barriers in acknowledging it and in offering resources and care. And so this is why your faith community is uniquely designed to be part of this movement, to bring justice. That means equality. It means respect and equal rights for people with disabilities. In the United States, we have the Americans uh, with Disabilities Act that includes equal rights for people with mental and physical impairments. And that was in the 1990s. And so the, the church is invited to be part of this work for justice. And that is where I invite you to think about how your worshiping community through worship can encourage people to join this movement for mental health justice. Beloved community coming together, working for justice for all. But what does mental health mean? I invite you to share in the chat when you hear that phrase, mental health, what definition comes to your mind? And when you think about the phrase mental illness, what definition comes to your mind? Please feel free to share in the chat. What's the difference between saying mental illness and mental health? What we're learning more and more is that we are all on a continuum. There is a spectrum of mental wellness. And my lived experience shows me it can change quickly. People in my family who live with bipolar disorder, uh, they can be up and then down, very far down the next day. In my own recovery from PTSD, I can get triggered. And so I can get a migraine and suddenly I am out. I cannot function with a full-blown migraine. And so I want to honor and respect that we all have mental health. Mental health is physical health. You have a brain, you have mental health. And just like our heart, and just like other parts of our body, we can sometimes uh, suffer symptoms of illness, right? And so we talk about mental illness as the non-casserole illness. We're not bringing casseroles to people who are stuck in bed with a depression. Or in the psychiatric hospital, I know as a pastor, so many people may be in the psychiatric hospital, but they are too ashamed or embarrassed to say anything. So we had no idea they were in a hospital for a week. And God forbid you yourself are a faith leader and end up in the psychiatric hospital. The stigma is so pronounced for faith leaders who themselves have a psychotic episode. 
I have a good friend and colleague whose husband was a pastor, had a psychotic episode after church, taken to the hospital in the psych ward for a week. He was discharged on Friday. And what do you think happened? In the pulpit the next, you know, couple of days, without a word to the church that their beloved pastor had been in the hospital the whole week. And think of how isolating that is. Not to be supported by your beloved community, not to have the prayers of the people. Why the silence? Why the isolation? The stigma. This is why including mental health in your worship service is the most powerful thing you can do to end the stigma, to break the silence, to talk about mental health as if it were just part of health in general. There is a much admired academic theologian, professor, teacher, and author that I learn from regularly named John Swinton, who is a professor at Aberdeen University. And he was one of the earliest um, Christian theologians to talk about a theology of mental health. In his book, Resurrecting the Person, Friendship and the Care of People with Mental Health Problems. And he's very thoughtful about his language. He doesn't prefer mental illness. He preferred, you know, this was 20 years ago, mental health problems. He says that the stigma is so serious that you can see it play out in everyday life. How many of you are fans of the old Superman movies? Any of you? Well, if you ever saw the Superman movies, you know about Lois Lane. Remember her? Lois Lane was played by a film star named Margot Kidder. And so this is a story John Swinton tells us to kind of demonstrate the power of stigma. Margot Kidder was um, living her life in Hollywood as Hollywood stars do. But one day she was found wandering the streets, very emotionally distraught, as she was Lois Lane in the Superman movies. And she also lived with bipolar disorder. And that's what people didn't know. They didn't know about her bipolar disorder. But when she was found roaming the streets, disheveled and very distraught, guess what the response was from the media? Can you guess? They were voyeuristic. They followed her, took pictures. And so before you knew it, around the world, people were sharing these very unflattering, disturbing images of her. And she was seen as a joke. Pretty soon, there were humorous anecdotes and stories about the funny side of her very serious health condition. She was humiliated and she was used as a means of entertainment. Not long after that, in uh, the same film, who played uh, Superman? Anybody know? It was Christopher Reeve and he was uh, diagnosed. Do you remember this? He was paralyzed from the neck down from being in an accident. And he would come up in public as somebody who was paralyzed. He was in the Academy Awards ceremony. He spoke at a democratic convention from his wheelchair. And when he did all of that, he was seen as a hero and, and really applauded as a survivor. And so what John Swinton points out to us is the drastic contrast in these both had physical conditions, right? Lois Lane had a brain condition and uh, Clark Kent had a other kind of physical condition that left him paralyzed and in a wheelchair. Uh, Kidder had an interview with Barbara Walters and this is what she said. She said, mental illness is the last taboo. It's the one that scares everyone to death. And I have to include myself in that. So I share that brief example just to say that when we think about mental health, there is still that very serious taboo. And it doesn't matter if you're a famous actress or if you're an everyday person, 
Uh, in my own family, my father had very serious bi bipolar disorder. And he had a symptom that was called anosognesia. And it meant that there was no ability for self insight. So no matter how sick he got, his brain would not let him acknowledge his illness. And so he remained untreated his adult life. He became a homeless person. He lost his job and career as a veterinarian and he lost the ability to connect to us as his family. And it's very tragic because he died from complications caused by his mental illness. But growing up in the church and becoming a pastor myself, I was ashamed and I hid this part of my life story. And it wasn't until he died and my church came out you know, with sympathy cards saying, oh, we're so sorry you've lost your father. And there are all these Hallmark cards, you know the kind, this little girl in a pink dress holding her father's hand and just assuming that that relationship was one of total love. And that's not how it was for me at all. But I had never felt comfortable or safe telling the truth about my family's life with serious mental illness. And so when my dad died, I realized as a person, I had a lot of healing to do. And part of my healing journey has been to tell the true stories about mental health challenges. Why do we have to separate ourselves? Why can't we bring our whole selves into the beloved community? Bring our whole lives into the church? So that's what this movement is about. In worship, showing up all of who we are. And so as we think about mental health, I want you to think about it is part of all of who we are, whether you have anxiety, depression, an eating disorder, an addiction, dementia, Alzheimer's, autism, bipolar, schizophrenia. I mean, there's 300 different kinds of diagnoses, right? Some are caused by the environment, some are genetic, some are situational, some are from historical trauma because of racism and other forms of systemic oppression. We all have mental health. And so I invite you to share in the chat, what comes to your mind as you think about the barriers to talking about mental health in church? What kind of stigmas do you experience in your life? I invite you to share as you are comfortable. So let's look at worship and the elements of worship together. I want to say that this presentation is focused on content, but in addition to the content, think about your worship space and think about how your sanctuary or wherever you are gathering is going to promote positive mental health. How is the lighting? Is your lighting such that it honors people's brains and the impact of harsh lighting on the brain? How are the sounds in worship? Are the sounds going to overwhelm people? Are there options for people who are sensitive to sound and light? In our church, we created a playground. Playground. We removed the pews in the first three rows. We put in carpet and pillows and cushions. We knew that some children, because of neurodiversity, neuro, their brains are diverse, neurodiversity, they need to roll around. They can't sit still on a hard wooden pew. They have to be somewhere soft and comfortable. They might have to lay on the ground and that's okay. We want people to come just as they are. I've talked to too many people who are, are not comfortable bringing their loved one to church. They don't wanna be judged. They don't wanna to have to explain why someone's behaving a certain way or looks a certain way. And so in addition to all the content, I invite you to think about your space and how you can create spaces that are welcoming for people to join in worship. Now, as we think about the elements of worship, I want to invite you to think about the power of language. When you develop your liturgies, your litanies, your prayers, the hymns you sing, the sermons, the children's messages, the benedictions, the passing of the peace, assurance of pardon, the call to confession, Language is so important. As I said at the beginning, we have the gift of spirituality, which can bring so much healing. But as you all know, there's been great harm done in the name of God. There's been toxic and 
really abusive theology when it comes to Christian religion. And so think about that. One of the places to be mindful of is this idea that mental health and mental health challenges, where do they come from? Throughout the scriptures and Christian tradition, some have interpreted mental illness as demon possession, as an evil spirit, as punishment from God. Is that what you believe? Have you been taught that? If we remain silent about the causes of mental health challenges and brain disorders and addictions, then people will assume that it is caused by an evil spirit or sin, because that is historically what the church has taught. And until we teach a different theology, people will continue to pass on that toxic theology. So part of the reason we want to include mental health and mental wellness in worship is to help adapt and change our theology to come alongside modern medicine and what brain science tells us. We have a lot of insight from science, and we know that so much of mental health is not punishment from God, you know, a, a evil spirit, but is a neurological, biochemical, physical reaction of the brain, either to an event, to a trauma, to an environment, or to a genetic disposition. So as an example, I wanted to share with you two different prayers. In my faith life, I've been really supported by the divine hours. This is a Phyllis Tickle translation. It's prayers throughout the day, and I start my day and end my day with the divine hours. So we're going to do a little experiment where I will share with you two very similar prayers, but there's a slight difference, and I would like you to listen for the difference. And as you listen to this prayer, think about this topic of mental illness mental health, mental health challenges, and addictions, okay? Here's the first prayer. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep me both outwardly in my body and inwardly in my soul so that I may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts, which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So I'll read the line especially that pertains to this discussion. Keep me both outwardly in my body and inwardly in my soul, that I may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Thinking about mental health challenges and brain disorders, addictions, and mental illness, what does that prayer say to you about the causes of mental health challenges or addictions or brain disorders? Feel free to share in the chat. What theology does that prayer assume when it comes to mental health challenges? So a very similar prayer. Lord God, almighty and everlasting one, you have brought me in safety to this new day. Preserve me with your mighty power that I may not fall into sin and be overcome by adversity. And in all I do, direct me to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. What did you notice about that prayer? What kind of theology does it offer about mental health, mental illness, brain disorders, addictions? It's very slight. Yes, the first one talks about evil, right? That line about being defended from all adversities and from all evil thoughts, right? All evil thoughts that might assault and hurt the soul. 
So I invite you to be mindful about our use of language. And the challenge with calling uh, like depression, for example, as evil, is then what does it say about God and about the presence of God? If someone is overwhelmed with what the church is calling evil thoughts, that creates a sense that God has forsaken them, God has abandoned them, that God is not present because of the evil power that has consumed them. Now, it's complicated because um, we want to acknowledge spiritual forces and powerful spirituality, and that for some, that language of evil might be part of their vocabulary. And so it's not to say there's no place in our theology for evil, but I do want to caution you that it can, for some people, be an additional harm and an additional barrier to really getting uh, help and to feeling hopeful. So I much rather see our churches and our prayers and theology acknowledge the presence of God, the presence of God, even in the midst of, of hard thoughts or challenging thoughts, or even if you want to use the language of evil, that God is present when there are harmful thoughts. Or, or what I like to call when we go through the valley of the shadow of mental illness, the valley of the shadow of mental health, based on Psalm 23. God is with me. I shall not fear, because you are with me, God. I personally find that second prayer um, very meaningful in my own mental health recovery from PTSD, because it acknowledges that I'm safe, that God's brought me into safety into a new day, that God will preserve me with God's power, that I won't fall into sin, and that I won't be overcome by adversity, and to help me do God's purpose. See, that's all really positive language. It acknowledges that I will face adversity, but it says that God will preserve me. And so that I wanted to give you that example of a very powerful prayer. How else can you imagine using this type of theology of mental health in your order of worship. What I would like to say is that although you have a special designated Sunday for Mental Health Sunday, that first Sunday of May, every Sunday, every Sunday is Mental Health Sunday. And so in your call to worship, in your opening prayer, in your call of confession, one thing you can do when you invite people to confess is to confess that we have stigmatized, we have shunned people, we have created our own barriers for people getting help and to ask for forgiveness. And then to encourage people to be places of welcome and hospitality for people who are neurodiverse. In our congregation, every Sunday we have a moment of peace. Sometimes it's called sharing the peace of Christ. And what we've done is made that a meditation moment. We know also from brain research that meditating is such a powerful way to support positive mental health. You can use this idea of passing the peace, the peace of Jesus Christ, which surpasses human understanding to incorporate meditative moments in the worship service, allowing people to relax their mind body, and spirit, and to invite the peace of Christ. You can use it for breathing exercises to help regulate people's mood. We've seen how powerful it is to take deep, slow breaths, counting in and counting out. And so you can literally, as a worship leader, model this kind of mindfulness and breathing in your worship. I also want to encourage you to join me in creating this mental health informed worship service. This is a new movement in the church. And so I invite all of you to become theologians with me, create resources with me, and then share them generously with each other. It is just recently that churches are starting to talk openly about mental health in our faith communities. And so be creative and experiment. You know your church the best. You know what people are going through in your congregation. You know your context. 
And so invite people who have lived experiences to meet with you and invite them to help create worship that would be meaningful to them. Invite them to share their testimonies. You can do it as a mission moment, or you could do it as a time of giving uh, their story as part of a sermon. You can also invite them to simply read or say a prayer. When we have our worship service, some of us have time with children or what we call a message for all ages. And it's never too early to start talking to children about mental health. I have a sample message for all ages that is in our worship resource that we provide to you. Um, when you go to the United Church of Canada website and you get our worship resource, there's a sample children's sermon. And it talks about uh, teaching kids that mental health is physical health. And just like you have a cold and you might need tissues, you might need to see a doctor or take medicine. Sometimes our brains uh, don't feel good either. And we need to see a doctor. We need tissues because of our emotions. We might be crying. Sometimes we take medicine to help our brains. So there's really simple ways at a very early age, we can start talking to children about mental health. When you have your prayers of the people, I encourage you to invite the language of mental health conditions in your prayers. When you say we pray for people who are in the hospital, say we pray for the people in the psychiatric hospital. We pray for people with depression. We pray for people who are struggling with addictions. We pray for people in recovery. You can say we pray for people with brain disorders and mental health challenges. And also don't forget to name their loved ones and their family members. Oftentimes we overlook the caregivers and the care providers. And so it's a powerful witness to name that in your prayers. There will be some pastoral care uh, dynamics after somebody has named in a prayer to the people. I have a friend who stood up in church one day and she shared very vulnerably that she had had thoughts of suicide and wanted the church to pray for her. After worship service, nobody talked to her. She left the church without anyone saying a single word to her. And so while she had been vulnerable and asked for help, how did people respond to her? Now, I don't think they were a bunch of mean people, but what I imagine is that they were very uncomfortable because they had not been trained or taught what you do you say to someone who has shared that. And so part of having a mental health informed worship service is to also be prepared for if people do share and are vulnerable, how do we surround them with care and support? Do we have people trained to provide that? Do we have resource numbers and referrals so that people can get the support they need? And most of all, do not leave people isolated and even more alone in a shroud of silence. Be sure that you go up and at least say, I heard what you said. I am praying for you. We care about you. We're so glad you are here. We're not the therapist. We're not the doctor. We're not going to try to fix anyone. But what we can do as beloved community is surround that person in God's love. I want to talk briefly about our sacraments. In the church, we have sacraments. Typically, we think of baptism and we have communion. And so briefly, in those two examples, we can remember our baptism. Baptism is how we acknowledge someone is fully included into the family of God at its most basic understanding. Tragically, in my life, we had someone die by suicide. And you notice my language. They didn't commit suicide, they died by suicide. Committing suicide sounds like you committed murder or you're a killer and you're a bad person. But someone who died by suicide is the language we would use that someone died from cancer or someone died from a heart attack. My niece died at 16 from suicide. And it was a great tragedy and we are all in shock and still just trying to recover from that terrible trauma. And my niece was baptized as an infant by me. I was the aunt who was a pastor and baptized this beautiful baby. And one of the gifts of baptism is that no matter what happens to someone in their life, 
they are part of God's family. And so when we baptize people, whether it's infant or believer's baptism, and when we carry out that sacrament in the church, we remind people of their baptism. And that's another moment for a mental health informed worship. We can name that this person was baptized and brought fully into the family of God and nothing will ever change that. Because part of that toxic theology that some still share is that there is a, a place in hell for people who die by suicide because it's a sin. And you can see how damaging that could be for the family members, the loved ones, to imagine that their loved one is in hell. And so naming the power of baptism to, to make that person fully included in God's family is so powerful. And also the sacrament of Holy Communion is another mental health moment. I have a whole litany in the Journal of Worship and Music Ministry printed by the United Church of Christ Musicians Association in the summer of 2021. I have a whole liturgy for communion that's mental health informed. But again, you have that beautiful imagery of the body of Christ, that we are the body of Christ, mind, body, spirit, that part of the body of Christ is the brain, and that Christ comes as one of us, that yes, Christ suffered and died, and in Christ's suffering, he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Words of despair, that Jesus had mental health, he had mental wellness. And he had moments of despair. And then Jesus was resurrected. Nancy Eastland is a disability scholar, and she talks about the resurrected Christ having his wounds on his hands and his scars, and that we worship a resurrected God who was disabled in his body. What if we thought about the disability in the mind as well, that we worship a Christ who knew the challenges that we all know in human suffering when our minds are suffering. And so in that communion, you have that moment to demonstrate the brokenness, the pain, and also how God puts us back together. God brings hope and healing, resurrection. Healing and hope are possible. And as the full body of Christ, mind, body, spirit, we represent that wholeness and that oneness. Sarah, in just, worship, yes. Just, just to interrupt for a second, um, a helpful learning for me was the how we can think of Jesus' new trauma, the, right, the trauma of crucifixion, and and then the hope that can come from resurrection as well. Uh, someone in the chat, just while we're talking of language, um, particular around your story, of of how we can uh, use better language around uh, death by suicide. Someone was wondering about um, considerations when leading a funeral service for someone who uh, has died by suicide. Do you want to hold that for later or do you oh, want no, to that's a great launch question. into that right now? Okay. Yes. So this is part of the work for us as faith leaders and worship leaders is to break the silence. There's a lot of stigma and there's a lot of resistance. And I encourage you to pay attention to your own resistance. How does it feel in your body? How do you feel? Um, in my own family's experience, there is still so much shame and guilt around my niece's death. Her parents, uh, her father is my brother. He is an emergency room doctor. My niece's mother was a psychiatrist. So you hear you have a child of a psychiatrist and a doctor who died by suicide. So much shame and guilt, terrible guilt. And it is very hard to say the word suicide because of the deep guilt and shame. So when we planned her funeral, I met with the pastor and I said to him, I said, it's so important that you as the pastor say the word suicide. We, we have heart, we cannot, as a family, you're so distraught, but we know through research and science and best practice that naming suicide in the funeral is helpful for healing, even though the family may be resistant to it. So that's a pastoral care moment to really talk with the family and, and encourage the use of the word at least one time. And that's what we did. We said it once in the eulogy 
and we didn't say it again, but we had to say that word because it's acknowledging the terrible complexity of this kind of grief and loss. It is so very complex. It's not like any other kind of death because there's tremendous guilt. Could we have saved them? What did we do wrong? How did we not know? And so thank you for that. Um, that's the, the best advice. The other thing is you never share details of the way the person died. A safe messaging is just simply say they died by suicide, period. If you give any graphic details, even a simple one word explanation, you're painting a visual picture for people about how to die by suicide. And we don't want to do anything that might give someone that type of imagery. It is a healing moment. And that's the gift of the church. We are healers and we are hope providers. And so even at a terrible loss of a suicide, that funeral is a tremendous moment for healing and for sharing hope. I wanna say a quick word about music. Music is a beautiful way to find healing and hope. And there's so many hymns in our traditions. And so I want you to share in the chat as you think about mental health and wellness, what kind of traditional church hymns come to your mind? And if you were to plan a mental health Sunday, what hymns would you like to be sung? And so share that in the chat and just help us kind of brainstorm together some ideas about that. In the bulb, there's a flower. I love that. We just sang that on Sunday. Such a hopeful one that that we all are just in this moment of transformation, that maybe we're going through a hard time, but we will come through to it. While you're sharing about traditional hymns, I want to celebrate that there are people with disabilities and mental health challenges who are now becoming trained as worship leaders and musicians in the church, writing new songs for the church. One of my colleagues in the United Church of Christ is Jacob Nault. And he has cerebral palsy, and he also lives with mental health challenges. A lot of times there's that intersectionality of um, dis physical disability and mental health disability. Jacob is um, someone who I have come to really respect and learn from. And so in a moment, you'll hear a new song that he created that I invite you to think about uh, for a mental health Sunday resource. But before we hear his song, he, he wrote a very brief devotional that gives you an example of how we can take scripture with the lens of mental health and disability and share that with people. So he writes about Exodus, the sixth chapter. This is what Jacob says. Living with my disability means that I complete physical tasks more slowly than able-bodied people. If I'm not completing a task quickly enough, sometimes people will jump in and do it for me, whether I want them to act or not. And then Jacob asked the question, how often have you felt like Moses? Exodus chapter six, verses one through 13, Moses believes God is calling him to do something really important, but Moses wonders, will they take me seriously? Am I really cut out for this? Moses might be remembering a time when someone pushed him aside because he couldn't be clear enough. Remember, Moses had a stutter, that he wasn't efficient enough or loud enough. Jacob says, this is the good news. None of that matters to God. God instead says that we are enough. God holds our worries of inadequacy, our internalized ableism, and honors all parts of them as part of what it means to be human. Then God says we are enough because we are people that God chooses to work for liberation and justice. And then Jacob gives this beautiful prayer. And I share this with you as one more example. This is the prayer. Gracious God, thank you for reminding us that we are enough. Help us to work for your liberation and justice whenever we perceive the need for change. Amen. So you see, that is a great way to interpret scripture. 
and lift up a biblical character who lived with a disability, what we today would call a disability, and how that has an impact on our mental health, and the reassurance through scripture that we are enough. Now I'd like Adam to share with you a video clip. It's a short video of Jacob himself playing at the keyboard and singing a new song for the church that talks about our body, mind, and spirit being made in the image of God. I will praise you for I am fearfully, fearfully, wonderfully, beautifully made. You made my body, you made my mind and heart. All that is in me will praise. I will praise. Doesn't he have a sweet voice? Just really tender, gentle, so beautiful, yes. Oh, he's so gifted. And so this is somebody who grew up um, with a physical disability and lives with mental health challenges, Jacob Nault, N-A-U-L-T. If you follow UCC on Instagram or Twitter, uh, Jacob's devotions for Lent are part of a Lenten series. The UCC Disabilities Ministry is doing every day in Lent. We have a devotional, and so Jacob is one of the contributors. And um, he's a resource that I will share um, in the chat, a website where you can follow up with him. But I love that, that imagery that we are wonderfully, fearfully made in our mind, our body, and spirit. And this is a great example of positive theology, right? Um, a hopeful theology of mental health and wellness. This um, idea that we are beautifully and wonderfully made just as we are. And it helps to uh, give an alternative to this idea that somebody with a mental health condition is broken, or damaged, something's wrong with us, um, to say, you know, just as you are, even if you're going through depression or PTSD, anxiety and addiction, you are still, and you will always be fearfully and wonderfully made. So moving into preaching, um, I wanna say a few words about the, the moment, the preaching moment and the opportunity preachers have um, to interpret scripture, like we've been discussing, in a way that provides an alternative theology, what I like to call a liberation theology of mental health justice. And some folks have asked, well, what scripture passages lend themselves to stories about mental health? And you'll probably guess my answer. <laughs> All of them. You know, every story is about the human story. The Bible is God's story and how humans have interpreted God throughout history. And, and we have always had brains and mental health. So it's just part of who we are. And so I encourage you, as if you're a lectionary preacher or whatever scriptures you preach on, um, maybe you have a different message in mind, but pause before you're preaching or preparing your sermon and think, wait, how can I weave into this message? a moment where I encourage or support people's mental health. 
one of the, the most beautiful descriptions I've heard of preaching is that it's a testimony. And so another opportunity you have is to give testimony to how God has shown up in the midst of mental health challenges. This helps to provide hope because so often when there is a real challenge, because of stigma and shame, we are isolated and we can be overwhelmed by the challenge. And so that word of hope is that to testify that God is present in the midst of that challenge. If you have a lived experience, and so what that means is if you yourself or a loved one have been through something, I encourage you to work with your spiritual director, your therapist, with with peers to say, how can I use this story of God to break the silence about mental illness? There's nothing more powerful than a personal testimony, and there are healthy and safe ways to do it. Nadia Boltz Weber says, we, we can tell from our scars, not from our wounds. So you don't show someone your open wound that's bleeding. You need to get help for that. You need a bandage. You need to see a doctor. But once your wound has started to heal and you're developing scar tissue, well, that's maybe a time where we can start to share in a positive way that demonstrates this is how you find help. This is how you find hope. This is how you find healing. So that is really a friendly challenge to all of you, is how to incorporate more personal testimonies into your worship service that show God's loving, presence in the midst of whatever challenges people face. And so I'm curious, um, and you can share in the chat, is um, what stories in the Bible come to your mind when you think about preaching on mental health or mental illness? What Bible stories come to your mind? John Swinton, who you heard me talk about earlier in that uh, example of stigma, also preaches quite a bit about mental health. I invited him to preach at my congregation. And so we're going to have a small clip from his preaching video. And the scripture he's preaching on is from the Gospel of Luke, the eighth chapter, verses 43 through 44. 43 through 48. And I will just read this brief passage to you. You might be surprised that this is a passage about mental health. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, and though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his clothes, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Then Jesus asked, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, master, the crowd surrounded you and pressed in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. For I noticed that power had gone from out of me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, how might you preach that message as a message about mental health, hope, and healing? What themes do you hear in that passage? While you're thinking about that, we're going to show a brief clip from Professor John Swinton preaching on this text. And the title of the sermon is Go in Peace. Larry, you want me to show the first, the first section you suggested? Yes. Okay. So one of the, the problems before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and probably after the pandemic, is loneliness and depression. There's a huge welling of loneliness in a society. You know, people long for relationships. That's where we get our value. That's where we get our connection. That's where we find our healing. But for many people within our society, it's impossible to find 
value in that sense, because it's impossible to find people that value you. Which takes us to the whole area of, of mental health and the important thing we're talking about, because the pandemic's a source of disconnection, but stigma is a source of disconnection. Now, stigma is the exact opposite of the way that Jesus teaches that we should be with one another. Stigma reduces a person to the smallest thing and then defines them by that. So the idea of stigma comes from the Greek slave trade, the ancient Greek slave trade, where a slave would buy, be bought by a master, the master would put a brand on the slave, and then the person would be reduced to the, the size of that brand. They're no longer a person, no longer a, 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 a name, no longer a family, just something to be bought and sold. And that's what stigma does. When we use a language, to shrink people to the size of their diagnosis. And we talk about things like schizophrenics or depressives. As soon as we use that kind of language, we're enhancing the stigma of people. We're taking away the, from their value. We're taking away from what Jesus says, the fullness of life is, which is life with Jesus, life with one another, life in community. So stigma is profoundly important to notice because it's a source of disconnection and it breaks the healing bond that we need in order for us to stay together as human beings. And let me give you an example of the way in which um, uh, stigma really does that, that kind of damage to people. In the research that I did for Finding Jesus in the Storm, one of the participants who was, was a good friend of mine uh, called Alan, he tells me the story of the day that he got his diagnosis. He said, I had been feeling, I'd been feeling really strange for some time. You know, I'd been hearing voices, he said, and I've been feeling that people were talking about me and it was just a really difficult time. So I, my mum persuaded me to go to the doctor who, who, who persuaded me to go to the psychiatrist. And he said, I remember the day very well. Uh, I was sitting in the psychiatrist's office and, and I said, can you give me your da my diagnosis? And the psychiatrist said, well, I, I don't know if that's a good thing. He said, I said, you've got to give him there. He said, well, Alan, you have schizophrenia. And he said, it was a shock to me because I thought my whole life's over. Now I'm a schizophrenic. Now I'm not going to have a job. Now I'm not going to have a future. Now I'm not going to have anything that I wanted. Now, what you want to notice there is all that happened was the doctor gave him a diagnosis. That diagnosis opened up this huge space of fear and for him, self-stigmatization. So he went back home in the bus and he sat down beside uh, a woman who he'd known for, for quite some time. And he said, he told this story to him. And as soon as he said, I have schizophrenia, she stood up, got off the bus and they never spoke again. Stigma, fear, alienation. So he went back home to his mum and he told his mum this story. And his mum said this, he says, mum said, Alan, you're not a schizophrenic, you're Alan, and I love you. I think that is the heart of Jesus' ministry. It doesn't matter what you, you, what you are, it doesn't matter where you are in life, it doesn't matter what other people think about you. I love you, Jesus says. And that's the kind of, that's the task that we have, isn't it? To bring that love, that healing reconnection to those who have been alienated, hurt and broken by foolishness of the world, as Paul would put it. I am not schizophrenia, I'm Alan, he said to me. There's a really interesting book. It's hard to stop because it's it's such an important message from John Swinton, and I can, we can share the link to the whole sermon for you to listen to later. But what you heard him do is he tell he told the story, that personal testimony, and connected it to the scripture in terms of the, the healing power of our faith and of Jesus and the scripture who said to the woman, your faith has made you well, go in peace. And the ability we have in the spirit of Christ's love is to bless people, to, to be at peace, and to know that you are loved, and the ability to experience spiritual health. Someone can have a poor mental health or a mental health challenge and still flourish in their spirituality. And new science, there's a book called The Awakened Brain 
by Dr. Miller, says that people who experience very deep depressions have the capacity to experience robust spirituality. That in our brain, there is a physical neurological connection between the low, low lows and the highs that we can attain in our faith. And so know that in, um, in our congregations, there are people who are experiencing those lows and we often wear a mask or we're very private and not open about what we're struggling with. In the United States, the newest statistic is that half of the population currently is experiencing a mental health challenge. And so what I encourage you is to go ahead and make that assumption that in your congregation, half the people there are going through some type of mental health challenge. And so the beautiful opportunity we have is in worship every Sunday, especially Mental Health Sunday, but every Sunday, is to harness the power of spirituality to provide people with hope and with healing, reminding them that they are not alone and that no matter what they are going through, God loves them unconditionally. We're going to have some time to invite you to engage in small group discussions. You've received a lot of information together today. And so we would like to invite some practical application. And so we will invite you to go into groups of I think about four people. And in your groups, I invite you to share what's coming up for you and what might God be calling you to do in terms of applying a mental health lens in your worship planning? What surprised you in this presentation? What challenged you? And maybe what more do you want to learn or what remains a question that you have? And so Adam, I believe we'll have you all go into your groups now. And, and the questions really are, What's God calling you to do in your context? What challenged you or surprised you? And then what more might you need to know as you move forward? So after our small groups, we'll have about um, 15 minutes, and then we'll come back into a large group and close out our time together. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for being present and for sharing in your small groups. I invite you to share in the chat as you're comfortable. You know, what bubbled up for you? What kinds of things might God be calling you to do in your faith community when it comes to breaking the silence about mental health challenges and mental illness and addictions and brain disorders? Um, your ideas might inspire and encourage others. So share in the chat, um, maybe what your next step is. What are you feeling called to do? Also, I'm curious to know what questions do you still have? Um, what are some issues or topics you want to learn more about? That's important to know as well. And then what might be next uh, in your own process? Um, as a person of faith who has a mind, body, and spirit, I want to encourage you to, to pay attention to your own well-being and mental health. And maybe this conversation has encouraged you to a reconnect with a care provider, a therapist, a counselor, a spiritual director, a doctor. Um, we cannot pour out of an empty cup, right? And so I, I want to encourage and bless you all to, to love yourself radically and to be on that healing journey uh, so that we can journey with others towards hope and healing. So as you share in the chat um, what God's calling you to do, um, what is your next step? I want to invite um, Adam to share a couple of resources we wanted you all to know about, and then to remind you all that he and I will stay on this Zoom call. If you want some time to debrief uh, with us, we will be here for a couple minutes afterwards. I have some resources that um, I felt called by God to create. It's part of this movement to break the silence. And the good news 
is that um, there's a lot more we can do. And I don't have the only story or the only view. You have a story. You have an opinion. You have your own theology. And so this is your personal invitation by me to join me in Breaking the Silence. These are two books that I have published. The first one, Blessed Are the Crazy, came out in 2014. And it's about breaking the silence, about mental illness, family, and church. It's my family story, my dad living with bipolar disorder, my brother living with bipolar disorder, and my cousin who had multiple mental illnesses, um, committed a murder in a psychotic episode, was sentenced to death and executed. And all of this happened while I was a pastor. And so I asked those theological questions and I, I asked the church, why are we so silent in these spaces? There's also a free study guide to that book. So a lot of churches will take that book and read it together and that creates space for conversation. Then in 2021, I wrote my second book about marriage and mental health. And this is another very stigmatized taboo topic, but a lot of marriages that end in divorce have mental health challenges. And we don't do a good enough job supporting unions, partnerships, where one or both partners have a mental health challenge. And so Blessed Union is a book that is available to you. In the next slide, there is another resource which just is coming out this spring. And this is a resource for children and teens and families schools and faith communities. I had shared that my niece died by suicide. And at um, her death, I felt called by God to directly provide resources for teens like my niece, Sydney. So the survival guide was inspired by her. This is a um, pocket-sized resource. It has prevention tools to prevent suicide. And um, it's, it's, I'm excited to get it in the hands of youth. And the other book is for groups, adults, to just begin talking about our kids and mental health and to encourage in our communities a collaboration. Um, it is a crisis, and so we need all hands on deck. So again, these are tools that I encourage you all to utilize and to know about. Well, as we wrap up our time together, I want to thank you so much for being part of this movement for mental health justice in our beloved faith communities. I pray that this has been a time where you're discerning, what's your role? What is God calling you to do? And who is God calling you to be? These resources uh, are available at chalicepress.com. That's the publisher, or you can find them on Amazon. I will be here for a few minutes. And um, I think Adam has a closing prayer. So if we, friends, if we want to, uh, you can stay muted for uh, your part in the bold print. We'll, we'll, we can join in this uh, closing blessing together. It is taken from the joint United Church of Canada, United Church of Christ Mental Health Worship Resources. The one who created all that is calls us by name and invites us into a life of abundant love. We, we go, go out into the world as God's beloved people, bringing holy love to all whom we meet. Jesus taught us to love one another as fiercely and freely as God loves each of us. And uh, with the power that binds us together as the body of Christ. We will embody Christ by shattering stigma and welcoming all, leaving no one outside. The Spirit fills us with the breath of life and urges us to imagine anew how to be the church in the world today. We will breathe deeply and move beyond what has been and what is. We will follow the Spirit and bring hope and healing to all who live in despair and brokenness. We will be the church. Thank you all so much for Thank your you, participation. Everyone. Thank you for the good work you have already done that you will do for the sake of beloved community, for the sake of sharing hope and healing. Blessings to you all.